Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. If you are using the event app, we encourage you to check into the session, update your activities, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end of each session. This session is TLP White and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app or the desktop site. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce you, your, uh, our, our chair, uh, Dr. Serge Strauss, uh, first, Serge. Thank you, Tracy. And good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone. I'm Serge Strauss, the chair of FIRST, and would like to welcome you to the opening of the 2020 Annual FIRST Conference. To be honest, when I was chosen to be the chair in 2019 in Edinburgh, I didn't really imagine opening the 2020 conference this way. And I'm sure the same is true for our conference chair, Derek Scholl. So Derek, Derek promised me he's going to wave to all of us. Sorry about that, because 2020 Zoom picked exactly the right moment to crash. Anyways, it's 2020, so here we go. Like the first conference team has tried very hard to make this an in-person meeting. And, but alas, viruses don't respect our efforts. This seems to be true in uh, the digital world, but also in the real world. But there's actually a good side to all of this. This is the largest ever first conference we've had. We have more than 2000 registered participa participants from over a hundred countries. And with over 71% first-time attendees, we are reaching out further than ever in line with our mission to connect instance responders around the globe. So I think this pandemic actually taught us how we can connect to people that aren't able to come to our events. In any case, a big welcome to all of you. What has not changed from the past year though is the outstanding quality of the program. Big, big thanks go to to the program committee and to Lucy, the program chair. For most of us, this event is just another click the Zoom link type thingy, but running an event on Zoom with over 2000 participants is not something you do on a rainy Saturday afternoon. Many thanks to the first events team, in particular to Tracy for shifting from uh, to virtuality so smoothly. So please a round of mental applause for all the people that made this possible. and. Uh, welcome again to the 2020 first annual conference. And with that, I hand over to Lucy for her introductory remarks. Thanks. Thank you, Serge. Uh, my name is Lucy Marat, also known as Lucy. I am the first 2020 program committee chair. And the program committee's name, I welcome everyone to the 32nd first annual conference virtual edition. I'm delighted to be here today. It has been an incredible journey that for me it started in Kuala Lumpur back in 2018. And I never imagined that we would have to prepare two different programs for one conference. Many people contributed to make this event possible, and I wanted to start by saying many thanks to the 2020 Program Committee, all the speakers, and the first uh, events team, and also to the board. Well, it seems that uh, different viruses in some way play a role in our community's history. In 1988, in a computer war, led to the birth of the computer security incident response teams. Third years ago, first was formed to bring response teams together and improve coordination. In 2020, a biological virus does not allow us uh, to meet in person, but it shall be grew a strong community that cooperates and share in the most adverse conditions. Today, this online platform is the place where defenders share. I hope you enjoy the program and the presentations uh, can be sources of ideas for new projects and cooperation that we will share with us in the next events. Thank you for joining us and let's get started. Um, I'm honored to introduce our opening keynote, Ron Gibert. Ron is a professor of political science and director of the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. 
Ron is uh, one of those uh, unique professionals who managed to combine in-depth technical knowledge in security and digital technologies with a strong political science background. He was appointed to the Order of Ontario for being among the first to recognize and take measures to mitigate growing threats to communications rights, openness, and security worldwide. At the Citizen Lab, Ron and his team have written more than 100 rating reports covering breathbreaking research on cyber espionage, commercial spyware, internet censorship, and human rights. He's also the author of The Black Code, Surveillance, Privacy, and the Dark Side of the Internet, and recently Reset, Claiming the Internet for Civil Society. And today we have the opportunity to hear from him about some investigations that uncover disturbing trends regarding surveillance and offensive operations against human rights. Ron will also discuss best ways to repair and restoring the internet as a sphere that supports human rights rather than diminishes them. Ron, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy and Serge and Derek and everybody else. Tracy, at, at first, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to do now the always very nerve wracking screen share. <laughs> <clears throat> and voila, everything OK? You can see? Yep, looks good. Yeah. OK, good. So thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to present at first. And um, you know, this is, is something I've hoped to do for a very long time. Um, in my presentation today, um, I, I want to begin by just, uh, for those of you who don't know about the Citizen Lab, uh, beyond what Lucy said in, in her introduction, we do research on digital security issues that arise out of human rights concerns. So we don't cover the entire landscape of cybersecurity. Instead, we focus in particular on those issues that affect average citizens instead of, say, businesses and governments. Um, <clears throat> the signature of the Citizen Lab is our mixture of methods. So I'm a social scientist by background, but um, many of the staff at the Citizen Lab, the researchers come from different disciplines. We especially leverage computer science, engineering science, and law policy analysis to do the type of work that we do. Uh, we're not an advocacy group. Uh, we see ourselves as, and our mission as putting forward evidence in the public interest. So we are kind of a digital watchdog is the best way to think about it. <clears throat> We've been around for well over um, uh, close to two decades now, actually, and have covered a, a, a wide variety of topics. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is focus in particular on our work on targeted digital espionage or targeted threats, we call it. Um, this area is uh, led by senior researchers Bill Marzak, John Scott Railton, and Masha Masashi Nishihata as well as a, a variety of other people <clears throat> on the team. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is kind of walk through a few stories of the research in this area, what we do, how we do it, and then take a step back to um, uh, discuss what the evidence shows. And the bottom line here is that I think there is a major crisis in global civil society and by extension, liberal democracy because of rising threats around um, uh, the type of activities that I'm going to describe in my talk today. So I want to end by um, having a, a short discussion about some ways we could respond to these threats, especially uh, the first community, which I think is uh, critical to uh, remedying some of the problems, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, we see in our research. So to begin, uh, our research often begins with what we call a patient zero, uh, somebody like Ahmad Mansour, uh, he was a human rights defender in the United Arab Emirates. Back in 2016, uh, Ahmad received these two text messages on his iPhone purporting to show evidence of torture in Emirati prisons. It'd be the type of thing that as a human rights defender, he might be tempted to click on. Instead, uh, he was suspicious of, of those messages, thankfully, and decided to forward them to Bill Marzak, senior researcher at the Citizen Lab, uh, Bill requisitioned a used iPhone and in a laboratory setting uh, managed to infect his own device. Um, and what he discovered was uh, that he was able to 
uh, get a copy of, of, the, of the spyware, uh, which was connected to an Israeli-based spyware company called NSO Group. Uh, Bill and the other members of our team had been tracking some of the infrastructure of NSO Group, but this was, of course, the first time that we managed to successfully uh, acquire uh, the spyware itself, infect our own device, and reverse engineer it. Um, at the time, NSO Group was uh, very shy of the media, as understandably, this is a marketplace that tends to operate in the shadows. Um, of course, now they're very much out there in the media, ironically, in part because of uh, Citizen Lab's research. Um, when they do speak to the media, they're pretty consistent about what they say. Um, they say we only sell to governments and we follow Israeli and local laws. That's 100% true, I would say. Uh, but they also say that their technology is strictly controlled to investigate serious matters of crime, terrorism, and so forth. Um, the problem really lies in this third statement. So what we have discovered is that while they claim their technology is sold to investigate these very serious matters, the problem is their clients define those terms in extremely broad ways to cover uh, virtually anything, uh, including journalists, human rights defenders, lawyers, and so on. Now, as I said, we were able to get a copy of the spyware at the time and um, had Ahmad Mansour clicked on that, those links, his iPhone would have been infected by what were then three separate Apple Zero Days. Of course, very powerful technology that could eavesdrop on everything that he was doing on his device, including uh, most importantly, intercepting his uh, uh, emails and SMS messages, even those that are end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, which is an important uh, marketing feature of this type of spyware, and turn on the uh, audio capture, video capture systems and track his movements and all of his contacts. So obviously very powerful technology. Um, I want to point out that we, when we discovered the spyware and the zero days, we promptly did a responsible disclosure to Apple. And there was a remarkable turnaround on the, on the patch for this. So Ahmad gave us those text messages on August 11th, 2016. And uh, two weeks later, uh, Apple pushed, pushed, out, pushed out the security update affecting approximately a billion devices worldwide. So for us, that was a, a very satisfying uh, outcome to that particular research project, one of the biggest uh, in the history of the Citizen Lab, I'd say. Um, now, the other way that we work is uh, often by partnering with local NGOs inside countries uh, that we're interested in investigating. And we had some, um, some, some data, some evidence suggesting there was a lot of NSO targeting in Mexico. And so what we did is uh, partner with local human rights organizations. And in particular, our senior researcher, John Scott Railton, got in touch with uh, this person, Luis Fernando Garcia, and explained to him, what we are looking for is artifacts that show us a person has been targeted. And, and the, the, the Achilles heel, if you will, of, of the spyware technology that we're investigating are the art artifacts that come in the form of shortened links on SMS messages or emails or whatever that we can link to the company's uh, infrastructure and confidently say, yes, this person was targeted, um, not necessarily that they, their device was infected because the spyware is very stealthy. Um, but the evidence of targeting is significant enough because you can say that there are no controls. This is the, the case that we want to emphasize. So beginning in 2017, we did this in Mexico and found uh, really quite a, uh, a widespread reckless abuse of NSO's targeting. Here's just a few samples of some of the you know, salacious text messages that were sent to people trying to alarm them, um, you know, um, uh, make them anxious so that they might click on a link. Uh, the one in the bottom middle, I think is a good illustration of that. You've probably all seen something like this. You know, Mr. Simon, your daughter was in an accident. Um, you know, she's in grave condition. Click on this link, etc. You know, a lot of people with children would be tempted to click on this link. You know, so it's highly personalized. It's um, you know tailored to this particular person. 
Uh, even the daughter's ac accurate name is mentioned. So there's a, a bit of effort that's put into um, uh, the social engineering part of the equation. Um, as I said, the, the case in Mexico was, was quite horrible. And I, I wanna just illustrate something here. Recall that NSO markets its technology under the auspices of helping governments fight serious matters of crime and terrorism. And <clears throat> what they have done in their marketing is trumpet the fact that their technology was used in Mexico to help investigate uh, serious issues around the drug cartels. Well, what we found is that investigative journalists who were investigating collusion between the government and cartels and corruption involving uh, Mexican cartels were themselves uh, targeted with this type of spyware, including this unfortunate person, Javier Hardanis, who is an investigative journalist covering um, uh, the drug cartels in Mexico. He was murdered in broad daylight on the street. And uh, within a couple of days, his uh, colleague at the newspaper where he worked uh, received uh, spyware messages, um, as did his wife, uh, who was um, in mourning. Um, so it goes to show that the controls around this in the context of Mexico were horrible. Over the course of uh, two years, roughly two years, we discovered more than uh, 25 targets um, in civil society, including journalists and their family members, lawyers, public health advocates, people who are advocating for uh, attacks on sugary beverages to, to help with the obesity problem in Mexico were even targeted with this spyware. Of course, government opposition figures, anti-corruption investigators, even international investigators into mass disappearances. Um, so what we see here is reckless targeting and serial abuses. And I would go so far as to say what happens in Mexico, what we saw over that roughly two year period is symptomatic of a global problem here. You have governments that are all too willing to purchase this very sophisticated spyware, but when it comes to how they are going to use it, who they are going to target, there are very few, if any, controls. And as a consequence of the fact that many governments lack public accountability, lack pro proper oversight, independent oversight, even something so basic as warranting processes are often absent. Um, authoritarian regimes, autocrats, kleptocrats, they are going to go after what they consider to be any threat to their regime. Journalists, especially human rights defenders, opposition figures. Now, <clears throat> there's a, another way in which we go about the research, which is more on the network infrastructure level. So, um, you know, here's a stylized diagram of how companies like uh, NSO structure uh, their products and services in order to obfuscate as best they can um, the, the infrastructure that they provide to their government clients. The problem, of course, is that um, just like everyone else on the internet, even these spyware companies leave trails and over many years, we've developed a variety of methods using different data sources to effectively uh, track this infrastructure and in some cases identify who the government clients are using both network scanning data as well as open source intelligence methods. And we've done this with a number of spyware companies over the years. Perhaps many people will be familiar uh, with these pictures, with these diagrams. So here's uh, an example of one report we did in 2014 with the then Italian-based, uh, Italy-based um, spyware company hacking team. And the picture that you see here is a very disturbing one. Why? Because of the government clients of hacking team spyware at that time that we could identify through this network scanning uh, type of project, uh, we could see that many of them are among the world's worst abusers of human rights. Uh, the following year, we did the same thing with FinFisher, uh, which is a uh, German, Swiss, uh, UK company, depending on convenience and other factors for them. Um, and here, it's even a worse picture uh, that we see. Uh, with NSO Group, uh, led by Bill Marzak, uh, and using his DNS cache probing techniques, 
Uh, we undertook a, a similar global scanning for NSO's infrastructure, um, getting a good sense of who the various government clients are and where there were infected devices globally. So what you're seeing with this map is not the government clients per se, what you're seeing are the countries within which we know there are infected devices. In other words, where there is espionage taking place. Um, and uh, we were able to resolve these espionage, uh, espionage operations to more than 30 government uh, client groups. So we published that in 2018. And in that report, there was a very significant operator group that stu stood out for us and that was Saudi Arabia. Uh, as you can see here, there were a number of countries in which Saudi operators were using NSO spyware to undertake espionage against targets. And the one that stood out for us was, of course, Canada. Uh, what we could see was that there was a single infected device uh, in Canada that was moving pretty consistently between two locations, connecting from two different internet service providers. But beyond that, beyond that uh, vantage point from our network scanning, we had no information as to who the target was. So what we did was something quite novel for us. We, we uh, quite literally went door to door. And, and by that, I mean, we developed a short list of suspected targets who would be of interest to Saudi Arabia in Canada, in the Quebec region. And uh, our researcher, Bill Marzak, uh, traveled to Quebec interviewed these people and lo and behold, came across the target, which is this person, Omar Abdulaziz. Now at the time, Omar uh, was a very prominent critic of Saudi Arabia and especially Mohammed bin Salman. He uh, received um, Canadian permanent residency in 2014 and launched a, a very ambitious social media campaign against Saudi Arabia. He has a YouTube channel that's and a Twitter uh, account viewed by millions where um, he basically satirizes uh, the regime. So when we met with Omar, uh, Bill, with, his, with Omar's consent, looked through his text messages. And as soon as he saw this, uh, this domain, sundaydeals.com, he knew that Omar had been uh, targeted. And this message came coincidentally uh, a few hours after Omar had made a purchase for protein powder online. And so the DHL shipment, the fake DHL shipment notification tricked him and he, clicked, he recalled clicking on that link. Um, the other part of this, the um, evidence here was his pattern of movements. So recall that Omar, um, uh, what we could see from our vantage point was this infected device checking in from two different internet service providers at different times of the day. Omar, who was a student at Bishop's University in Canada, um, was pretty consistent in his pattern of life, if you will. He, he, it was summertime, school was not in session. So in the daytime, he would remain in his apartment, but then every evening, pretty consistently, he would go to the gym at the university and connect to the internet service provider there and those details uh, matched what we could see as well. What we didn't know at the time though, was that uh, Omar was a very close confidant of Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist. Um, so we released our report October 1st, 2018. The very next day, uh, Jamal Khashoggi went into the uh, Saudi consulate in Istanbul and of course was promptly executed to this day, his remains are not known. Um, and the reason I wanna pause on this is to show you the very lethal, potential lethal consequences of this type of uncontrolled proliferation of spyware. So for many months, uh, Omar and Jamal Khashoggi were in coordination. Uh, they were planning a very ambitious social media activism against Saudi Arabia. Uh, they were saying uh, quite inflammatory things over WhatsApp. They assumed that was safe because end-to-end -end encryption. Of course, the spyware defeated that. And Saudi operatives were basically looking over their shoulder as Omar and Jamal were saying things like you can see here, uh, very provocative from the perspective of Saudi Arabia, effectively a death sentence for Jamal Khashoggi. 
Um, now, moving forward, um, things have become a bit more difficult for us in our research, given the evolution of NSO and other spyware companies' technology. Um, in May 2019, um, WhatsApp discovered a, that NSO had uh, exploited a flaw in its uh, video calling function, allowing them to take over a device simply by ringing it up. Um, and when this happened, uh, Citizen Lab volunteered to work with WhatsApp to identify the civil society targets of um, the period of time in which this was taking place and for which uh, WhatsApp had data. So they gave us um, uh, data from a two week period of targeting, um, which was roughly, I think over about a thousand targets. And um, you know, starting with just the phone numbers that WhatsApp could give us, uh, we then went out and did OSINT research and were able to identify more than a hundred of them who were clearly civil society targets. In other words, definitely not terrorists or criminals, uh, at least as conventionally understood. Um, given that the way we work under research protocol, research ethics protocols at the University of Toronto, where we're based, we're not allowed to disclose the identities of the targets unless they give us permission or unless they come forward publicly themselves. And over time, many of them have. And so I just want to show you some of the illustrations of the serious nature of the targeting we discovered here. So among the victims, uh, Rwandan opposition figures who were tracked by death squads set out, sent out uh, by the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, were targeted in this manner. In India, numerous, I think more than 40 targets from uh, opposition figures to lawyers rep representing uh, marginalized and threatened ethnic groups in, uh, in India. Uh, Catalonia, case that continues right now, uh, finally, some of the uh, members of the Catalan uh, government and uh, those in exile uh, were targeting, including some opposition figures who were outside of Spain at the time when the targeting took place in places like Geneva, for example. Um, even uh, Roman Catholic bishops and a priest were targeted in, in Togo uh, using this type of spyware. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing here is a pretty disturbing picture where you have this, you know, very sophisticated technology being used uh, with virtually no control. Um, before I move on to what we can do about it, I just want to emphasize one point that um, what we see in our research and many people no doubt who are watching this presentation see as well, is that you don't need to necessarily use high-end spyware to accomplish your objectives, whatever does the trick works uh, just fine. And we, as, as often as we see sophisticated spyware, uh, we also see things uh, like this, for example, um, where um, you know, attackers are using uh, URL shorteners to um, basically go after people's credentials. Uh, this comes from a report we released uh, earlier this year called Dark Basin, uh, where, um, through an examination of various URL shorteners that were used by the operators behind this attack, we were able to identify um, thousands of targets in a really what was for us a bewildering array of issue areas from uh, financial trading, short sellers, divor divorce lawyers, to civil society targets. And in the course of our investigation, we were able to resolve all of this down to a, a single uh, operator based in India called Beltrox, which is um, basically a hack for hire operation. And, and the reason I want to uh, point this out is because, you know, this is not a uh, sophisticated company. What they're doing is, you know, about as basic as you can get a little Photoshopping of a Dropbox, you know, or other, um, cloud-based service to grab people's credentials, but it can be very effective. And what we discovered was that the data that came from this hack for hire operation was used to successfully penetrate um, a very large and well-organized environmental advocacy campaign uh, involving groups like Greenpeace and climate investigation centers and so on 
um, I, I will emphasize here, we don't know ultimately who the uh, client was, the ultimate client uh, of this hack for hire operation. But I can say all of the groups that were involved in, in the environmental part of this were part of the Exxon New uh, campaign. So let's take a step back and, and look at the broader context and, and why I think this is such a serious problem. Um, if you look here, um, this kind of, you know, captures what I think are the major um, uh, characteristics of the geopolitical environment within which we live and within which civil society has to operate. Now, for, you know, I've studied uh, the internet and, and global security issues for my entire professional career for, you know, probably 30 years. And I can definitely remember a time at the very beginning when everyone simply assumed that the internet, mobile technology, social media would empower civil society, would lead to this, you know, uh, liberalization and democratization. And what we have seen uh, empirically, really, over the course of the research of the Citizen Lab is a much different picture. Um, right now, uh, we are seeing rising authoritarianism worldwide for a variety of complex reasons, but no doubt about it. Um, democracy is in retreat. Authoritarian practices are spreading. Um, you also have um, this um, uh, normalization of offense in cyberspace. So a lot of um, uh, nation states are uh, jumping on this bandwagon, developing cyber commands, um, developing techniques and methods. Why? Well, two reasons. One, defense is expensive and very difficult. And meanwhile, um, going on the offense is very lucrative. It pays off. And so we're seeing a kind of normalization of offensive doctrine. And then naturally what happens afterwards is you have a whole private sector that sprouts up to service um, these needs. So everything ranging from the high-end private intelligence uh, hack for, all the way down to the, to the hack for higher uh, um, services at the lower end. But what this means overall is a shrinking space for global civil society. Um, we are seeing targeted attacks uh, really I would even go so far as to say neutralizing the work of a lot of civil society advocates, opposition groups, journalists, human rights defenders, as um, the technology that they depend on becomes effectively their most uh, vulnerable point of exposure and, and facing this rising uh, threat environment. This is a very, very serious problem uh, for those of us who care about liberal democracy globally. Uh, just a second here. So um, I want to also illustrate uh, an important dynamic in this space, uh, what I would characterize as a market failure for civil society. So looking um, at the universe of cases that we study, um, one finding sticks out, and that is the very same nation state operators who target industry and government that we hear about in the news and through industry reports, target civil society. And they use, in many cases, the very same techniques, methods, tradecraft, espionage services, and so on. Uh, the big difference here is that when it comes to industry and government, however poor their network defenses may be in specific cases, generally speaking, these are well-resourced organizations. They can go out and pay the, you know, mandiants and fire eyes to come in, uh, investigate, install sophisticated equipment to defend their, their networks and monitor 24 hours uh, and help them defend against these type of threats. When it comes to civil society, you know, typically speaking, I'm generalizing here, but especially for civil society in the global south, you're lucky to have a person who you know basically knows how to connect the printer and has to deal with you know um, uh, old operating systems that are unlicensed unpatched software they have no resources no capability so you have this huge market failure around the most vulnerable part of society and that's part of the reason we're seeing this um, this growing and alarming problem as evidenced by ours and, and others' research. Um, what are the consequences? Well, 
uh, you have low IT capacity, lack of basic policies, devices, networks, so software often insecure, lots of misinformation, you know, people passing um, folk wisdom back and forth, lack of systematic uh, um, uh, 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 risk analysis uh, within the organizations because they simply don't have the capacity to do it. And the attacks are really disrupting the work, the safety and trust of these groups. And again, I wanna emphasize here, the evidence shows the same groups that target industry and governments are also targeting these type of organizations. Um, there was a study done uh, earlier this year that was published, uh, led by um, former Citizen Lab person, now at ETH Zurich, Leonard Mashmeyer. Uh, what Leonard did to illustrate the point that I'm talking about was go through and, and, and analyze more than 700 industry reports to see how they characterize uh, the, the threats to civil society, how they are represented in their reports. And what we found is that the vast majority of industry reports don't even bother to mention civil society, or if they do, they get merely a passing mention. And that's because obviously civil society are not very good prospective paying clients. Uh, those industry reports are marketing tools. They're meant to attract clients. And so um, for most of the industry, civil society is largely an afterthought. Um, so what to do about this? Well, uh, one thing I want to say is that there is no one single approach that suffices. When people talk about mitigating some of the harms that we're seeing in our research, the first place we often go to is around export controls. And here there's been some promising uh, developments. So in Europe in particular, there is a very strong movement to um, beefen up uh, export controls around this type of surveillance software. I would say that's um, remarkable progress uh, that's happening there. But the big problem, of course, is that many of the spyware companies are located in countries that won't be subject to this type of regulation. For example, NSO Group, which is based in Israel, already goes through export controls. Every one of its uh, 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 exports of its surveillance technology has to be approved by the Israeli Ministry of Defense. Uh, so there's already an export control regime. The problem is it's very permissive. It doesn't uh, limit what the company can, should be doing to prevent the type of abuse of its technology that we see. Another area that's emerging that I think is also uh, interesting and possibly very positive is around litigation. So as a result of our research, research by Amnesty International and other groups, um, many of the victims of this type of surveillance have gone to court. They've either sued NSO group or sued, attempted to sue the countries that have targeted them. WhatsApp most famously has uh, sued NSO group and, and the proceedings of that uh, court case are underway. Um, ultimately, I think this could um, help um, uh, modify the behavior of the companies insofar as it begins to affect their bottom line. So if their shareholders start to see fines coming in, um, you know, the legal, the liabilities mounting, they may put pressure on the companies to be better with respect to their um, human rights due diligence mechanisms, which are almost entirely absent as it stands right now, in spite of the lip service that some of them pay to it. The last um, area of mitigation I would point to it is a bit more uh, ambitious and also I would say long-term, but I think ultimately this is the most effective. The way I'd describe it would be a multi-pronged community approach to really rectify this problem, we all need to work together. And that's why I'm, I'm very excited to speak to this community in particular. Um, over years, many people have asked us, what is the best model? Um, should we you know, create some kind of international organization that's going to deal with threats to civil society around the type of um, un, unregulated spyware that, that you and others have discovered? And, Together, what we have 
learned is that the way to deal with this adequately is by this type of pragmatic, multi-pronged community approach. So obviously, evidence-based research of the type that Citizen Lab does and what investigative journalists do and what groups like Amnesty International does, and even you know, what the industries uh, in their investigations can do to spotlight better civil society and remedy this gap that Leonard Mashmeyer, myself and others identified is very important. You wanna bring the abuses to light, but you don't wanna end there. We need to rectify the problem of most of civil society not having in-house technical capacity. Now, in the past, the way that that problem was dealt with is, you know, groups would parachute in for a week and give some kind of technical training, and then they would leave. And then uh, those who received the training would promptly forget about it. And of course, that doesn't work. Instead, what we need to do is invest in local capacity, identify people within the communities who can be trained up over years and develop a team um, so that they can receive indicators and know what to do with them in their local communities. So that is an investment that has to happen from outside um, and, and mostly from philanthropic uh, organizations. Foundations can help here. Industry can really help. Um, one of the uh, uh, greatest things I've seen uh, over the in recent years has been the type of collaboration we've been able to develop with some uh, threat teams in, um, in alliance with the companies where they say, okay, we're going to, uh, we recognize this as a problem. There's a gap here, a market failure. One way we can rectify it is by allocating a specific amount of time on our threats team to work on these problems, either by spending, you know, a sabbatical at um, Citizen Lab or other organizations and working with the civil society groups. And I think that uh, in the long term can be a very effective way to deal with this issue. And then lastly is advocacy and legal support. And again here, most civil society targets who are facing this type of, frankly, unlawful surveillance can do something about it if they had legal support. And um, that of course is very expensive. So we need to have law firms that are willing to recognize these problems and uh, step in and help um, remediate them by offering services to the civil society targets. Um, before I end, I just wanna say there's a piece of good news around all of this. Serge Droz, who you um, saw at the beginning, uh, the chair of FIRST uh, this year, and Leonard Mashmeyer, the person I, I mentioned, as well as others, have started a special interest group at, at FIRST precisely on this topic. So that's why, uh, again, to, to end my presentation here, I just wanna say, this is a, a, a really promising outcome and something that I hope will help remediate uh, some of the problems uh, that I've identified. So I'll end there and thank you very much uh, for patiently listening to me. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Ron. Um, uh, I have a question uh, here that came from, from the audience, so I'd like to uh, read it to you. Um, how can organizations best protect uh, their key employees and leadership from this type of attacks by NSO group or similar? Can MDM solutions provide uh, mitigation to this type of threat? Well, before I answer that question, I will say that we at Citizen Lab, we do not uh, provide services. We are not, um, uh, our first uh, um, mission is not to um, uh, look at the situation for the private sector or for governments, because we assume that there are many capable uh, businesses out there that provide those services and can uh, help with um, the type of threats that I described. When it comes to NSOs, spyware in particular, and, and other sorts of spyware like it, you know, this is, first of all, um, technology that's designed to evade forensic detection, that's designed to be very stealthy. And the latest iteration that we've seen, um, which is, uh, you know, evolving to a no-click version of, of the targeting, is extremely concerning because it's very hard to defend against. Um, we're seeing uh, the companies learning how to exploit vulnerabilities in the 
in the basic protocols of the telecommunications infrastructure, uh, SS7, uh, uh, weaknesses in the SS7 protocol, for example. Um, one area where I think uh, there could be a response would be among the major platforms, cloud providers and others, if they spent time investigating these problems um, and working in collaboration with groups like ours, potentially, um, we, may, we may be able to get better visibility into what companies like NSO are doing to help build up uh, defenses. Um, I think WhatsApp's response was a good example here. So when they discovered that um, series of no-click attacks on their platform in April, May, 2019, they did two things. One is, um, you know, they worked with us and, and we entered into an arrangement voluntarily where um, we started investigating who the targets were. So, you know, that's not an easy thing for a company like that to do, uh, especially a company like WhatsApp, which is sensitive about how they handle uh, sharing of customer data. Um, but we got through that with the appropriate, um, you know, kind of conversations and lawyers involved and agreements in place that, that were comfortable to both sides. Um, so that type of data sharing, I think, is, is very important. And of course, they spoke out and, and went so far as to, as to sue NSO Group, which I think is noteworthy as well, because um, the platforms have a responsibility for the security of all of their users, and they have a responsibility not to allow their infrastructure to be abused in this manner. And so um, I, would, I would point to that as an example of, of how we can hopefully over time mitigate some of the problems. Thank you. Uh, I have another question here from Jerry van der Ham. Uh, what's the name of the new SIG and can you say what they are trying to do in what kind of capabilities, I, oops, I think I would need, uh, I think Jerry Maybe it is. Yeah, I think that uh, Jeremy's questions were not mentioned to you. Uh, I will. I will go to the next question. So, uh, Alexander Yeager, thanks, Ron, for your talk. Besides, uh, maybe join this mentioned SIG. Is there uh, other kind that individuals listen right now could you do? Uh, the one thing you always wanted uh, uh, to ask responders to do. So it's a comment. Okay. Um, I see here one ahead, about. Ex I see a question here from Sharif about export controls. Shall I take? Oh, that okay. Yeah, you, you can go. Uh, um, I will just mark the other questions as uh, respond, and and I will go back to another question from France. Uh, so go ahead and answer um, the okay. one from. So he asks about export controls hurting capacity building globally. Teaching cybersecurity and academia often rely on tools that may be included in such an export control approach. This is a very good question because um, uh, many of us in this community had some serious concerns about um, what was really one of the first attempts to coordinate export controls around spyware in the Vossenar arrangement back in 2014, I think it was, or 2013. And the language and the approach in that initial attempt was very broad and we believed would actually um, potentially hinder some of the security research that even we at Citizen Lab were doing. Um, I think that export controls can be done more intelligently and more precisely to avoid that type of problem. You can simply build in exceptions for public interest research or scientific research that um, would exempt the researchers from that type of uh, control. So it just has to be done intelligently. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, a question from Franz Lenemeyer. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, there are currently some initiatives like Cyber Peace Institute, Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace and many others. Are you cooperating and collaborating with them? Yes, I'm actually on the uh, advisory board uh, for Cyber Peace Institute. Um, I've seen it from the very origins when it was first uh, articulated and proposed right up to now where it's in very capable hands uh, with, with Stefan Duguin and his team and uh, Marice Schake 
um, you know, these are people who understand the, the um, scope and scale of the problems that affect civil society, and they are building a, a promising um, institution to help coordinate efforts to deal with it, especially among the most uh, at-risk groups worldwide. So really trying to position themselves to remedy that market failure that I described. So I, I'm quite excited that, you know, we've gone from a time where very little was happening five years ago to now things like Cyber Peace Institute, to um, the special interest group at first that, that Serge and Leonard are helping to organize. These are all important steps that we can take uh, to help remedy the problems. Thank you, Ron. Uh, a question from Nicholas Liu. Awesome presentation, Ron. Uh, are there any sort of similar organizations to Citizen or to Citizen Lab that are out here uh, with this involving threat? Uh, what's a way forward to address the need for so many NGOs that uh, may need this support? How can you make organizations like Citizen Lab scale? That's an excellent question. I spent a lot of time thinking about that um, because frankly, within the university environment where Citizen Lab is based, the type of work that we do is, is really quite rare. And to me, that's, that's always been a bit frustrating because uh, the methods and tools that we rely on are not like some kind of secret sauce. You know, it's not like we have some magic. Uh, we're just doing basic, very careful evidence-based research using legal methods, using open source intelligence methods, using computer science, engineering science methods. There, there's no reason why there couldn't be 100 citizen labs in universities the world over. The biggest constraints uh, really are around the risks of the research, professional risks, reputational risks, risks from industry. Uh, I have been sued. The University of Toronto has been threatened with lawsuits for the work that we do. Um, and there are no doubt many people who might otherwise be interested in this topic that don't wanna go there because they see it as too risky um, for their professional reputation. It's also a bit unorthodox. So it's not very conventional, especially from some of the you know, computer science, engineering science disciplines. So I'm hoping that that will change. I, I think it will change inevitably uh, as, as generational changes happen. So new, younger professors coming um, I'm encouraged to see some of them talking about building things like this in, in other universities. Um, outside of universities, um, you know, the threat intelligence companies do almost, you know, exactly what we do, but for uh, their corporate and government clients, uh, we would like to see that change to have them pay more attention to this area. And I, I think uh, that's starting to happen. I'd like to see more of it. And then you have within the NGO space. Uh, we uh, collaborate with Amnesty International, for example, who has a tech lab um, in involving people who are former affiliates of Citizen Lab. And uh, to see them doing the type of work that they do is really encouraging for us because it means there's just not one group doing it. When you have other groups, you know, um, singing from the same chorus sheet, so to speak, uh, pointing out that there is the same problems that they are identifying as we are, this really helps reinforce the message. And of course we can collaborate and share you know, indicators and, and share methods and so on. Um, so that's very promising as well. I, I think you know, in, in the short term, it's a bit frustrating, but I hope over time that we'll see more of this happening, especially within universities where you have the resources, the capacity, the independence to do this type of research. Thank you, Ron. Uh, I have two more questions here. And uh, one is from Ankita. Uh, how can no-click infections be detected so that prior action is taken before an attack occurs? That's a good question that I wouldn't have the ability to answer. It'd be something that we'd wanna send to my uh, technical group to talk about. Um, I, I think, you know, what I can say is, look, this is uh, really, daunting to contemplate, to think about, um, geez, you know, somebody could just ring up my phone 
and take it over. And then once they are inside the device, they can remove any evidence that the targeting even happened in the first place. Um, and of course, the, the spyware is usually designed to be very stealthy, to remove itself, um, essentially self-destruct and evade even forensic detection makes it very, very difficult. Um, I believe, and again, I'd, I would defer to the people who have greater technical knowledge than me on this topic, but my view is that the visibility into this type of targeting um, can come from the platforms, from the large uh, telcos in some cases, from companies like WhatsApp, that, that if they concentrate their resources on, they may be able to identify this sort of targeting and, uh, and alert victims to it. But it is really like a nuclear option of spyware in terms of how um, you know, this allows the companies and the operators to go dark in terms of the type of targeting that they're doing. Um, another question here from Cash. Uh, wouldn't the right solution be to include digital privacy as part of the human rights? There, are, there always uh, will be companies to provide tools and those uh, misusing tools shouldn't be globally punishable to break privacy this way? Yes, I, I, you know, in ideal terms, sure, that would be great. Uh, the problem here is that you have uh, a large and growing number of countries, nation states, that even if they sign on to such an agreement would routinely violate it in practice because the trend lines are in the opposite direction right now. Um, governments are developing capacities to maneuver in and through cyberspace, to go on the offense. And there are uh, numerous companies that are supplying them with the tools, the products and services to do that. And so, um, you know, ultimately that's where we would like to see things go is that for there to be some kind of you know, global agreement on norms and proper protections for privacy. Um, but as it stands now, that's not the world we live in. Um, so until we get there, we have to work on solving the immediate threats. And that's why, you know, one has to be more pragmatic and look towards, you know, drawing in people who care about these problems in the short term from industry, uh, from the legal professions, from academia, um, to, to start mitigating um, some of the most serious threats to civil society that are growing. Uh, and I will come back to one of the questions uh, here from, and uh, I think it came from Alex, uh, our last question. What uh, you run would uh, uh, ask us, as I mean, uh, incident response community to do about it? Well, I, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. I, I, I would implore everybody who's part of the incident response community to think about to what degree um, their, their professional work is directed towards the most vulnerable populations in the world or within the countries that they live. And think about ways that um, those vulnerable populations can get proper assistance and training, not just a one-off, not just parachuting in and you know, telling them to use this tool or that tool and then leaving, but long-term sustainable su support for the most vulnerable populations. Um, because right now, as I said in my presentation, uh, that type of support is sorely needed and it's missing and they simply don't have the capacity. So you know, within your communities, if you could just think about what are the ways in which I could do this frankly, this type of public service, right? This is, this is not thinking about how to make money. It's not thinking about how to build up a reputation. It's, it's, it's an effort towards the collective well-being of the community of which you're a part. And so anything that can be done to help mitigate some of these threats, I think would be uh, really appreciated and welcome. And I, I would direct you again to this new special interest group that Serge and, and Leonard are starting because okay. what they want to do there is coordinate those efforts. Okay, thank you so much. In fact, uh, there is also a presentation that is part of this of the um, program today that is about the CV search. It's That's exactly right. 
exactly about uh, about this. So I think uh, people should follow that and, yeah. and see what the guys uh, uh, are bringing the community in terms of incident response for, and related to the human rights. Exactly. So uh, I will thank you so much, Brown, for your time, for being here with us and for bringing such an amazing uh, presentation. And uh, I hope you will stay with us a little bit longer and uh, and give us the privilege of your of your company to our conference. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. And thank you for Tracy. having me. Thank you, everybody, for for attending. I appreciate it very much. Great. Thanks, everybody. We're going to go into about a twenty minute break before the breakout sessions begin. So go ahead and, and enjoy your twenty minutes. Thanks for joining the opening. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>